Hello everybody, welcome to MySQL QA episode number 6. Today we'll uh, work further on what we started in uh, QA episode 5 and, and even before that number 4. So 4 was a bit of an introduction uh, to the BigQuery framework and to BigQuery and uh, episode 5 looked into how you can set up a QA run, so preparatory with MTR to SQL, or you could simply skip that and use our prepared SQL file, uh, then run pQuery run and generate some bugs. Now in this episode we'll go and have a look what we can do with these bugs, um, because there's a few steps that you can follow which will make analyzing all these hundreds of crashes that you will be seeing a lot easier. And yes, you will be seeing uh, hundreds of crashes. Uh, pQuery is quite capable of producing between 80 to 120 uh, crashes per hour. Uh, so I just did a single threaded run just for testing something for my colleague George and Vadim. And um, that particular run uh, was, uh, let's see, uh, 16 hours single threaded so there was only a single threaded uh, pQuery running on the server and there was only a single thread uh, accessing the client uh, 25 seconds per trial and that produced exactly 800 crashes uh, so you can see how powerful that is and it was about uh, 1930 trials okay so let's dive into it I'll quickly first give a rerun uh, of some of the things that we saw pQuery run uh, just very briefly so that we can get started. So by now you should have Picona QA, you know by now that you can branch that off uh, Launchpad. Uh, so for those who haven't seen the previous episodes it's uh, very simply uh, branching off Picona QA. Okay, so let's set up our pQuery run. Uh, so we're going to use the pQuery uh, Percona server binary, but you can also swap this into the MySQL binary or the MariaDB binary. Um, pQuery simply forwards to pQuery uh, Percona server. Okay, we're going to be using the main um, Mer, uh, the main uh, MySQL server, Pagoda server, MariaDB, merged MTR test cases and cleaned up uh, SQL files. So it's a 500,000 line file, about 48 megabytes if I remember correctly, uh, and it produces uh, crashes very, very well. Um, so it's got quite a comprehensive coverage of almost all SQL out there. Uh, this particular SQL file together with pQuery is able to tell you if whatever you're testing is full of bugs or not full of bugs within a matter of minutes. Uh, if you let it run for half an hour to an hour and you review your crashes and there is a new a new crash that you haven't seen before and that doesn't get filtered out by our filter list and that crash has happened like let's say one in every ten runs or even one in every three or four runs then you can for sure say that the product you're about to release is um, is not good at all and should be revisited by the developers before uh, releasing it. Okay, so that's the SQL file. Now we have uh, the base directory here. Uh, so in this case, I'll be using a, a slightly older version of uh, Percona Server 5623. Uh, the debug version, of course, you want to use a debug build to make sure that you trigger uh, all debug assertions uh, that are there in the debug code, but uh, that get rendered out if you use an optimized build. And for the rest, I'm just going to leave all settings pretty much as default. Um, so we will be doing uh, 15 second runs, uh, very short burst runs, uh, even in 15 seconds it can process thousands of queries thanks to the C++ core and um, that's uh, all for the run setup. So we're just going to run single threaded, we'll look a little bit into multi threaded uh, later on maybe in this episode or maybe another one. In any case we'll be running single threaded for the moment. Um, Okay, so exiting out of that. Um, okay, that's pretty much all. So let me just do this in screen so that uh, for whatever reason if I have to walk away and my session gets disconnected uh, it will still be accessible from uh, the screen uh, console. Okay, so here we've started our uh, pQuery and you can see all the summary details at the, uh, the top. We're not using any special uh, My Extra. So My Extra is just simply where we set some extra options we want to pass to MySQL D. We're using our uh, standard QA options, uh, again thanks to Shane Bester for helping out with that one. And um, 
Oh, I forgot to save, so we're still using the 5.77 SQL file, so let me just cancel out of that. As soon as you press Ctrl C, it captures actually that uh, command and it uh, will clean up properly. So let me just edit that again and uh, mark this out and uh, start again. Okay, great. So yes, this time we're using the correct uh, SQL file and we're running. So <coughs> for the moment, uh, BigQuery is uh, BigQuery Run is able to run on 5.6. Uh, it can also run on 5.7, but you just have to slightly hack the script because uh, 5.7 has a very different way of initializing um, the server. Here we are using still MySQL install DB. So you know, in, in due time, in the next few weeks, we'll probably upgrade uh, BigQuery Run so that it can. Uh, simply directly detect if it's working with 5.6 or 5.7 and then take it from there. The startup scripts that I've shown you in the last episode uh, that can be used as a handy add-on to whatever testing you're doing, they are already upgraded to 5.7 and so they uh, handle 5.7 or 5.6 automatically detects it uh, based on the version string. Okay, so in our first trial, uh, only 15 seconds, but straight away we have a crash here, uh, a crash that uh, we've seen quite a number of times, so there's some uh, problem with uh, the char character sets or something like that that uh, upstream Oracle needs to fix. Okay, so uh, we had about 7,000 queries executed here in a matter of uh, 8 seconds, so you can see how, how fast that works, about 1,000 queries a second. Here we had a run of um, 15 seconds and 7,000, so in this case we had slightly more successful queries, but a few less queries uh, per second. Okay, so let's let us leave this run for uh, a little while, uh, just so that we can get some crashes. Okay, so here in this particular case, the server didn't shut down properly, uh, so we had to kill it. Uh, in time, we might actually put a feature in that uh, when this particular situation happens, we might save the trial, and you can analyze it a bit further. Okay, so I'm just going to let this run for about 5 to 10 minutes so, so that we have a, a number of nice crashes and then uh, we can show how we can go about analyzing those further. So, okay, so here it's uh, found another bug uh, that might or might not be new. I do not recognize that particular text string. So it, it automatically analyzes the error log and finds the most relevant text string. Um, there's a little utility that can be used for this. I can actually jump out of this, uh, so detach with Control A uh, and then D. So you want to press down Control and then hit A and then D, and that opts you out of the screen session. Um, let me just jump into it for one second. I want to just show you something else while we have the opportunity. Um, so row 0 ins 365. So there is a file that's called known underscore box dot strings and in there it's got all the text strings uh, and there is the 365 one that we were just looking at and this turns out to be a bug in uh, Pagona server. So you can see the bugs in Pagona server, MySQL server etc. You can see this list. Uh, this is a list of all the bugs that uh, BigQuery found uh, and that were logged either uh, to Upstream or uh, to Pagona web uh, or to Pagona. So we found a few hundred bugs in Upstream, uh, under a hundred bugs, something like 70 or 80 uh, bugs in Pagona server. And um, we haven't tested MariaDB, uh, but of course we welcome the MariaDB guys to test their own version with BigQuery. Okay, so uh, how do these bug strings, how are they relevant? Um, well, first of all, there are three different types. So here you can see where the line number, uh, where there's a line number base. And so you have to file uh, and a particular line. And you can see there's lots of bugs in these particular files. Uh, I think they're part of the InnoDB core. And uh, y you can see, even get an idea as to where particular bug or clusters of bugs are hiding. And of course, that would be in the more complex code of InnoDB, etc. 
Okay, so further down the list we have an assertion based. So in this case it's no longer using the file name and the line number, but it's using a particular assertion. So for instance, m underscore status uh, equals da error. Uh, that was an assertion that was hit. Um, of course we have our beloved and most famous void protocol end statement. Um, you know, there might be a, a, a few more uh, uh, that that can be added to this list, but you know, when you're handling so many bugs, it's relatively hard to um, make sure that you have every sub bug under a particular assertion message. Um, so, where the two above fail, or or maybe directly from the from the outset, it uses um, the first frame from an error from the error log, and you can see here all the uh, first frames. So there's a few things that uh, you have to understand about this list and how to use it. First let me show you the utility. Um, and if we just uh, jump back into uh, the screen here, we're just going to see which directory it's running in, 47051. So this is on uh, TMPFS, uh, as we saw in one of the previous episodes, where it runs, and then it saves those to uh, whatever directory that we've pointed it to for saving the results, so the, the, the actual uh, uh, directory that contains the results. So let me just jump into um, this directory, not on TMPFS because it will be gone from there as soon as the trial is over, but into the uh, storage directory to find out what the particular um, uh, uh, bug were, was in this case. So we can have a look at the error lock and I can show you a bit more about those bug strings. By the way, you can um, let me just jump out of here. You can set these options here. So, um, sorry, here. So your working directory, and uh, you know, in my case, that's uh, some volume that I've named SDA, just a separate hard disk, uh, where it's uh, got this random directory number. And you can also point it to a run directory. Um, so in this case, uh, I'm using TMPFS, which is, of course, very fast in memory. Um, or you could use some solid solid state drive uh, to to have your trials uh, run on there so that they execute very fast. Uh, in other words, you want to maximize the number of queries per second. So the C++ core plus uh, using TMPFS uh, makes for you know a very very fast execution of SQL, resulting in you know for example, 1,000 queries per second on a, on a reasonable machine. This is just an i7 uh, server with 16 gig of RAM. And um, uh, in this case, it's using the memory uh, to execute the trials. So as soon as the trial is finished, it will take the information from uh, the run there and store it in the work directory. Um, so here, uh, the number for the work directory and the number for the uh, the number for the work directory and the number for uh, TMPFS would be the same. In the uh, meantime, we've also got another crash here. Timer equals null, which is a very known uh, crash to us. We we've seen this a lot. It's actually one of our blocker bugs that we're going to look at fixing as soon as possible, just so that it uh, doesn't stop us from running QA in a more proper fashion. Um, so let me just jump back out of this. Uh, four seven, four seven. Okay. So here you can see that it's stored whichever trials uh, were uh, unsuccessful, i.e., re resulted in a crash. So <laughs> from QA perspective, that's successful. Um, and if we look into you can see that it's running trial 22 and in a little while uh, that will be removed and it will go to trial uh, 23 so they're each about 15 seconds so let's have a look at some other files in this directory so there's a data template which is generated before any of the trials start you can see it here by the time uh, it matches the number one and that uh, template is simply copied into each trial uh, for running so that uh, you have a you have a clean 
data directory from the outset. Uh, there's also a log directory which uh, simply contains the MySQL install DB and you also have a log directory per trial which contains your uh, MySQL D error log, uh, always named master.err in each particular trial. Um, then we have the SQL file and we save a copy as we said in our last uh, episode here to make sure that we could uh, rerun with this particular SQL file or maybe just to consult it. Of course when you have such a large file it's uh, and it was 43 megabytes not 48 uh, when you have such a large file um, it doesn't make much sense to try and rerun with the same SQL file in a random fashion but when you have a very small SQL file and you produce a number of bugs then it might be interesting to rerun with that SQL file. Okay, then we have a MySQL D directory, and we saw this again in our last episode. Basically, stores a copy of the MySQL D used. Uh, this is great for using GDB and all the, also all the libraries, uh, so that if the developers want to uh, check out the OS parts of the stack trace, they can do so as well. And if any of this uh, sounds like, oh wow, what is all the stuff you're telling me here? What's a stack trace? What's all that? Just jump back into one of our previous episodes, uh, episode number three, uh, which was all on GDB, uh, one and a half hours of debugging in GDB, and it will tell you what a stack trace or backtrace and all that sort of thing is. Um, and if you've never played around with Linux, go and have a look at episode one, which is all about Linux and GNU. And if you don't uh, know how to build a MySQL server, of course you can just download a tarball from the uh, MySQL website, but it's more interesting to use the latest tree from the developers. Jump into episode number two, which was all about building uh, MySQL. Okay, so, Let's jump back to this episode. So we have MySQL D directory there. We have the pQuery binary that we used. Uh, and in this case, it's, I, I recognize it by the size. It's the pQuery binary, which has the Pagona server client library included. And uh, we have a copy of pQuery run. And notice here that it's just got a little prefix, uh, pQuery which is just there to uh, avoid other scripts picking up on this file. Um, and the run log. So if we look at pQuery run, uh, it's basically a similar output to what we're seeing in our screen session. So you can see by now we're up to seven bucks in uh, a matter of uh, 17 minutes. Uh, it's actually interesting that by trial 30 we're only up to seven seven bucks because usually it's about oh, one point yeah, one to two, uh, maybe one to two point two or something like that bucks per trials. Okay, so in the meantime, you can see we've uh, generated a few more crashes and let us now look at that uh, directory again. And you can see it's happily processing, it's up to trial 31, uh, so you can see what it's doing there in the background. And of course we can uh, monitor uh, what processes are being started. So you can see the MySQL D started there with all the uh, QA related options uh, that make our life a bit easier. Um, Etc. 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 You can also see how it's using the air. So now it's in the meantime up to trial 32. It's using the socket air. Uh, the bit file is being stored. Random port number. Uh, etc. <laughs> okay. So um, random is only so random. <laughs> okay. Now let's have a look. Um, Okay, so just jumping a little bit back into time, uh, if you remember we were looking at um, the known bugs uh, strings list. So you remember this file that we were looking at. And um, well, by the way, if, if you wonder what these at the bottom are here, um, here we had to use a crashing query to uh, make sure it was significant enough uh, a description to not filter other things and in these cases here we have to um, specify uh, a special hacky way and, and you know here this means uh, and and uh, these uh, dots here are regex for uh, a double quote. It, it's all slightly complex but the reason why we had to do it like this is because there are certain messages like THD that are so uh, short that you know they might filter out a whole lot of different bugs so you know we've, we've taken care of it in this way but um, there's only a very limited amount of bugs that um, 
that fall into this category but just if you're wondering what this is uh, should give you a little bit of an idea okay so let's have a look at uh, and this is now inside one of the trials and, and this format will always look very similar so we have our data directory we have our log directory you saw that in the log directory we have our uh, uh, MySQL the error log our pit file which kind of makes sense uh, our socket file again makes sense and uh, if you don't know what these things are so pit is of course the process identifier it needs a little file in which it stores the uh, PID uh, socket is of course your uh, Linux socket uh, that it's using to communicate uh, between the client and the server. So these two files are just generated by MySQL D. Um, quite uh, quite straightforward. Um, there's also a file here, start, which basically shows you how uh, MySQL D was started. Uh, you could possibly use this to start the server. Uh, that might work, uh, and then you could connect in with the client. So basically, you just have to use uh, uh, MySQL uh, here without the D, and then point it to. Um, actually, let's see if we can start it this way. I uh, just want to make sure that I'm not going to be interrupting the run, so let's have a little look. Um, no, let's not start it, um, but what I'll do is I'll show you how to... Um, so let's assume that after the run is finished you start it and then you want to access the client. Very simple, you just um, point it to the same socket, uh, so you point it to um, uh, your root, uh, like user ID your root, and to the socket, and that would end up going into this particular MySQL D. Of course you want to make a subdirectory etc. as well. You might want to copy in, copy in the data directory as well to make sure that uh, it's actually got a data directory there. So it's not as straightforward as just running this. Uh, it's just simply showing you exactly how it was started, which is uh, quite handy to um, review exactly what's what's happening. Okay, so that's that. TMP. So these are just basically the TMP files and you know this was uh, one of the it seems all fairly straightforward and self-explanatory if you see it like this but um, one thing that you might not realize is if you're running 20 or 30 different threads in RKG for example uh, as I mentioned before we're not using RKG anymore but just as a bit of an historical fact and things uh, the sort of things you have to think about when you're running it with 20 30 threads and each of those threads is writing to the uh, slash TMP instead of um, to a specific directory per MySQL D then some of these files might actually start conflicting with each other uh, etc so you know again uh, you want to point it to a particular, a particular temp directory. And I think it was uh, John Embertson uh, from Oracle who first uh, picked up on this one uh, many, many years ago. Uh, so thanks, John, we, we owe you one for that. Okay, so in here you can also find the pQuery log. And um, pQuery is a very brief, very powerful, short utility, only a few hundred lines of code, and it outputs us very minimal, just whatever is needed. Basically points you to the database I was using, one thread running, 100,000 per thread queries, uh, the log directory, user ID used, the socket used, uh, version information which is great for, for later review. And then in this case, uh, something that we've seen in one of the previous episodes as well, the last 250 consecutive queries all failed. Um, so, you know, when it's running through its thousands of queries, all of a sudden it starts seeing 250 queries in a row that all failed one after the other. That can happen, and when it happens, uh, pQuery stops um, because it assumes, okay, maybe I've run into some sort of crash or assert, or maybe the user was dropped, or the user privileges were dropped, and, uh, and a flush uh, privileges or whatever was run, or, or something similar. And so it ends the run. So that's all fairly straightforward and of course the input uh, SQL file. Also interesting to see here is the actual SQL file it used and now don't confuse this with the um, SQL file that we were looking at a little bit earlier here. This one, notice that this is about 43 uh, megabytes and this particular file here is uh, only 2 megabytes. So what is happening here? Well, pQuery is randomly, uh, and, and you might remember this from 
uh, previous episodes. So it has the main SQL file, the one, uh, the one above. Just remember the one, the one that we were looking at uh, a little bit earlier. And uh, in that particular SQL file, it has all these lines of SQL code, 500,000 of them. And so what pQuery does is it takes um, it takes each of these statements one by one, and um, in a random fashion. And so it starts executing those. So this one might be this one, this one might be this one, etc. So that particular one might have been executed here, that one might have been executed here, 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 and then, you know, again, this one might have been executed there, and, and so on. So in a random fashion, uh, pQuery replaced this and it saves a copy of that file here which of course is very handy because now we have a smaller file uh, that we could use for replaying and also of course it's sequential now it's no longer random it, it has become sequential because of um, the execution against MySQL D and at some point it crashed um, so now we have an ex uh, a test case right we have a, a test case that we can go and uh, play around with so let's have a look what's inside this file so in this case it was just executing you know various bits of sql and at the moment this doesn't really look like a very handy test case you don't want to post this to a bug report let's have a look at the end okay there's 13 13,000 lines, 13,000 treatment lines of SQL code. Even if we filter out uh, the failures and the end bits, you can see at the end here it's gone, MySQL server has gone away. And remember that that's the 250 queries that it's running. So if we go up about 250 queries, um, that uh, will stop. So here you can see the, the queries are no longer showing that uh, the MySQL server has gone away. But uh, you can see some other errors that are happening. Uh, see, uh, failed the command can not be executed when global transactions to active state. So you could really go and debug every little error that you come across, which is it's kind of great too. But for the moment, we're we're not at all looking into that. We're not looking into SQL related errors simply because we've seen so many crashes, and you know, of course, that takes priority. Um, by now, we've mapped. Um, f at least for Percona server, probably about 90-95% of all the single threaded bugs out there. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, that's a great achievement. We've also done uh, quite similar for upstream, you know, of course that's part of our testing because we do test Percona server. Um, and uh, yeah, when when we've run into an upstream bug, we've locked it with them. So even if you filter out uh, all these comments as to what goes wrong with individual queries, you would still end up with um, with about six thousand lines of SQL, which of course you cannot just go ahead and put uh, post to a bug report. Still, you know, it might be handy for us QA guys because we can reduce it further. But if you want to be nice, then uh, you want to post a three or four line or a ten line uh, test uh, case, which is going to be much easier for the developers. In any case, if we execute this particular SQL against a server using similar uh, startup options as we've used here, and uh, making sure that all other things like version number and whatever are identical, and that we're using a debug build in the same fashion, uh, so we could just use simply this directory and go back in there, start it up, um, and if we execute this, uh, we have a good uh, possibility of actually reproducing the bug uh, that is there. Now just something about uh, QA in general. So something that uh, goes wrong quite often in QA and, and with RQG this was this was really painful. So you have uh, an SQL file with uh, various bits of SQL and uh, for example RQG was executing all this SQL and then at some moment, at some point in time there is a crash. Now what happened was uh, all this was logged to some external file. Okay, great. So the QA engineer thinks, hey, great, I got my SQL file and I'm going to execute uh, this SQL. But then the problem was uh, this um, this SQL did not reproduce the crash. Well, you can straight away see why. It's because the crashing statement was never included as part of the actual SQL. So you go to just before the crash 
but you missed actually executing this this line. Uh, that's one problem. The other problem is that uh, sometimes this needs a little bit of a helping hand and you want to three times execute a failing statement. Uh, don't ask me why, but I suppose it has something to do with uh, timeouts, uh, triggering a particular code path, uh, something like that. Uh, in any case, from clear experience, if you execute the failing statement, so the failing statement you can pull out of the core dump or pull out of the MySQL error log. If you execute that three times, uh, you're going to be uh, more easily reproducing the crash. It's regularly that uh, uh, my colleague Ramesh or myself comment and bugs like uh, please execute this test case two or three times simply because we know that it's going to be slightly sporadic and if you uh, execute it two or three times you're very likely going to hit the bug. Um, so yeah, that's that's something to really uh, notice and learn. Notice also that pQuery doesn't have this issue from the outset, right? Uh, if you will remember the 250 the 250 lines, so with uh, pQuery, we execute uh, until there are at least 250 queries that. Um, that have failed. Unless maybe you just go at the end of your run or something like that. I don't know exactly how that's handled. But most of the time we're going to be executing until 250 statements failed. So uh, that's one security. Um, we've also taken further steps. So of course if you run all this you're going to have your error log. And that's going to contain the crashing SQL statement, provided of course that this is a crash that is based on an SQL statement. Sometimes crashes are based on some internal dynamism or whatever in the code that uh, uh, is not directly related to a particular SQL statement. Um, that's a different situation, but in that case of course this is not relevant to start with. Okay, so we have some sort of SQL uh, failing statement in um, in the error log and we of course have our uh, usually our core dump when we had a crash and um, there's a failing statement in there as well. By the way if you've never played around with core dumps and whatever have a look at episode 3 and also have a look at there's a, a file which is called uh, setup uh, I'll just type it up here setup server um, uh, setup server dot sh uh, and in there you can see how to configure core dumps. Uh, I wouldn't just go and execute this file, please don't, uh, because this is really meant to set up a QA server. Unless you've got a spare box to play with, uh, a Linux box, then you can use this. But otherwise just go and have a look in there and extract whatever it is you need to get your core dumps configured to get your uh, settings for your server right. Um, so maybe something I could have mentioned in uh, episode 4. In any case, there you go. If you haven't uh, set up your server correctly yet, uh, oh, it was mentioned actually in episode 2 where we were talking about how to build a MySQL server. I think it was mentioned there. In any case, set up server. It's there for you to go and uh, have a look at and uh, extract whatever it is you need. Okay, so your failing statement is stored within the error log and within the core dump. Now, how about if we extract those failing statements, uh, and of course that would be usually the same statement. However, if you're writing multi-threaded, your core dump could have multiple failing statements, and you know there's been a few blog posts on this, uh, a bit, a bit of bit of back and forth between Shane Bester and myself, um, trying to find the best solution uh, for extracting all the failing statements out of core dump. Um, we, we found a reasonably good solution, and you can find that on the Pagona blog. Just search for uh, last executed statement, uh, extract Percona or something like that. And uh, there's a blog post and on the bottom of that in the comments there is a link to the latest blog post which has a full script. Uh, and by the way, that script is available uh, here too. I'll quickly show you. Um, Percona. GDB um, extract. So here this script uh, sets a few options for GDB and then uh, there's two different uh, uh, 
ways that it tries and extracts for each thread and you can see here the threads and it goes up to 110 or something like that or 102 um, it tries and extracts the failing uh, SQL statement by the way the reason why there's two different uh, ways is because uh, the variable name that the query string is stored in you can see here how it changed from one to another uh, in the later versions of MySQL so it basically just tries and does both if it fails on one that's fine it will just continue with the others so again here there might be uh, multiple statements and, and that's fine okay so let me just hop out of this clear the screen okay so how about if we took all that and we put that at the end of our uh, SQL trace and we make sure that we do that uh, three times and, and the reason why we want to do that three times is uh, similar here for you know you want to run it three times so you take all your failing SQL statements from your error log which is actually only one uh, and all your failing statements from your core you put them at the end and you execute it three times now you're going to have an SQL uh, test case which very high 90 to 100 percent uh, reproduces your um, reproduces your um, your crash or your assert that you've been seeing. So we'll see a little bit more about how that actually works in practice. Uh, for the moment, I'm just going to delete this. Okay, so let's go and have a look at how we can do this in practice. Okay, so in the meantime, we've uh, so far been running for about 35 minutes and we've produced uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 22, 23 bucks. Could have simply jump, jumped it to my run and oh, in the meantime, 24. And, and you can see here is a very interesting crash. Here's another interesting crash. Um, so all of that is fine. However, I'm going to jump back one more time because I realized that I forgot one item. Uh, let me just jump back into here. Okay, so here we've got our uh, MySQL D error log. So let's have a look into this one. And let's just scroll to the bottom and there, there's our crash and there's our assertion that we saw pop up before. Remember that that was the assertion message that we were seeing. And uh, here's our stack trace. Now, you could see a few different things. So in this case, it's used the assertion message for uh, uniquely identifying the bug. And you can also see here, this is the first frame. Uh, the first, uh, this is actually the first frame. Actually, these are even earlier frames, but this is the first readable, um, identifiable string from our stack trace. So we could have used something like this too. And, and you recognize this from, uh, from the secondary or the third type of the known bug string list. So usually we grab this without a leading underscore. This is just a parsing reason that we're doing that. Um, also, if you ever run into a bug, um, you know, have a look at the search message, have a look at this, because it might be in our bug list already. However, you know, pulling all this out, of course, has to be automated. And uh, here in this case, this is the particular file and line number it uh, failed on. So in some cases, we'll have that at the end with a crash 11, uh, etc. with a signal 11. Okay, so let me just jump out of here. And of course, uh, apologies if I'm talking a little bit fast, but of course there's a lot to show uh, in this episode. So there is a, a file that's a script that's called a text string, and you can execute that against the error log, and there's your uh, particular uh, assertion message. So this uh, particular script automatically finds the most relevant identifiable string. It's not perfect, and I'll show you in a minute why, but it's it's reasonable. So first it looks for an assertion failure, because of course that's very specific. Uh, <clears throat> then it looks for, um, I think, a line number or something like that. Uh, and then it looks for the first frame. So in this case, we have uh, an assertion message. So that's what it, what it used. So all of these... Um, 
all of these uh, known bugs have all been extracted from the error log and you can see here that uh, indeed there's nowhere an underscore although most of these would have an underscore uh, in them in the error log um, all of these have been extracted from the error log uh, by this uh, automation and by this automated script now what's the only gotcha um, so the assertion messages that's fine they will stay the same the first frame will very likely stay the same it's it's unlikely to change however there is a bit of a gotcha here when the line number is used and um, the, the, there's one shortcoming in this script. Uh, we should have really used the first frame uh, because it's a more stable identifier uh, as the secondary option, but I think we use it as the last, um, uh, which is still reasonable. I mean, there's still a lot of uh, issues there that are identified this way. Um, but the problem with this is that the line numbers over time might change. So if you have a new build, a new version of MySQL, of course your line number might have slightly changed uh, in a later release. And you could see it uh, here, for instance, is this the same? So you could see the same bug on two different line numbers. Um, so when you run into a particular issue, and uh, what does this mean? Uh, when you run into a particular issue, you run this text string script and you can come into this file, if, if it's line number based, if it's assertion based, or if it's uh, first frame based, don't worry about it. But if it's line number based, you want to come in here, uh, have a quick look. Oh, it's very close to this line, so it might be this bug. Go and have a look at the bug report. And if the bug report matches, you know, that's probably the bug you're seeing. So, you know, don't feel like you've found a new bug. It's probably just a, a bug that. Uh, that has been uh, identified with a new line number and so it's not being filtered uh, in the same way. So that does happen um, and it's a slight shortcoming of the text string approach. However, we use this all the time. Uh, we're not seeing uh, too many changes that happen from time to time. I, I remember my colleague Ramesh mentioning it too. Um, but you know, a lot of the issues are filtered out based on a third or first frame. Okay. So let's jump out of this. So in this case, y you can see the particular issue there. Let's take one more example, just so that it's a little bit clear. Um, oh, we want to swap into log, and we want to run the text string against this file. Okay, so it's a very similar one. Um, uh, this one is two, this one is four, but it's, it's very similar. And indeed, if we were to go and look into uh, the known bug strings. I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to search for this. Okay, so um, there's our uh, two and four, and they are both uh, MySQL bugs. Uh, in fact, I've just logged them into one uh, bug report because they're so very similar. Um, so these issues will be filtered out uh, later on automatically. Okay, great. So, you know, now we've got all these crashes. <laughs> what do we do with them? Uh, so you could go in and analyze each of each of them manually, which would be a lot of painful work. Um, and in the beginning, I suppose, that's how we all started. So remember, you got a nice copy of MySQL D binary there, so you can just simply point to it. You can hop into the core. You can backtrace and you can start analyzing. You can jump into a frame. You can list the code, you can start looking at variables, uh, and so on. So, uh, all nice and well, uh, and maybe necessary in a few remote cases, but of course we want to automate uh, most of this. So we've got all these issues here. Now, what is the ultimate goal of running into a crash? It's of course to log a bug report, and of course to get the developer to fix the bug. Now, having your stack traces and whatever uh, available, <laughs> and as I said, random is not very random. Um, uh, having our stack traces available is um, is is a good way uh, to uh, make a bug report. You could run a thread apply all BT, and uh, and then it would show you all the threads that uh, are running. Uh, however. Um, um, the developer is going to look at those uh, stack traces and they might or might not be able to find uh, the bug report. In most cases they should be able to, however in some cases there might be some locking, some complex uh, 
background processes, whatever going on, and it might not be immediately clear what the bug is. So in most cases, a test case is going to be very helpful, if not necessary. How do we go from, you know, uh, having all this to individual bug reports and individual um, SQL uh, files, SQL test cases that are short, crisp, uh, nice for the developer to run and to play with, uh, so they can start uh, GDB directly uh, under under. Um, they can start MySQL D directly on the GDB and uh, do some live debugging and actually uh, find out what particular issue is happening just by stepping line by line through the code, etc., etc., etc. So having a test case is going to make their lives a lot easier. So we got all these crashes, which is great, but now we need to get test cases. So this is where today's utilities come in and uh, I know we spent 45 minutes already reviewing this I hope you found it a bit interesting now we're going to get into what to do actually with uh, these uh, particular failed trials okay so we've developed a number of uh, utilities the first one is called uh, prep uh, red and red stands for a producer so pquery prepare reducer and this is um, just have a look at the script. This is just a little script that um, prepares um, these trials for reducer. Uh, what is reducer? If you remember from our previous um, uh, video, reducer is uh, test case reducer uh, and so we're going to use that against that uh, flat SQL file. Remember that we had this uh, flat SQL file and we're going to reduce this into very short and crisp uh, test cases. So what you want to make sure is that you point this to a location where reducer is available. So if you've uh, downloaded it into your home directory as suggested in one of the previous videos, then it would look something like this. Ranch and util reduce reducer. And as I mentioned, it's just for historical reasons that reducer is still included with RKG, um, but we're not using RKG anymore. So you just have to retrieve it simply for getting the reducer script. Uh, I've got it stored in another location, so for me it will work. And I'll execute it uh, now. So notice that you can run this even while your uh, run, your QA run is still ongoing. That's fine. Okay, so when we start this, it's giving you a little bit of uh, information and um, there have been a few changes uh, as, as we went along. So in, in your case, uh, all this would matter very little and you can just hit enter twice and it will continue. Um, but basically it's giving you an overview of uh, my extra as in what um, uh, settings were passed to MySQL D in our case it was nothing and what sort of QA options were added to to the run okay so I'm just hitting enter twice and now it will start processing the trials so what is it doing in the background here it's copying the reducer script into its own copy specifically for each trial it's customizing reducer to look to for a specific um, bug that is there. So again, it's using that text script to find a specific text string that reducer will have to look for in the error log um, to find um, to find this particular bug, to reproduce this particular bug. It's also doing a few other things. It's extracting uh, the queries from the core dump, however many there are, in our case it would be usually one because we were running single threadedly. It's adding a three times to the SQL trace as we saw before, it's doing all of this automatically for you and it's extracting it from the error log if it finds any and it adds that three times to the SQL trace as well. So you can see all of this is, is a lot of automation that you don't have to do. So picture this. You have uh, the pQuery framework you have uh, RKG and so the only reason why we got to RKG is because we want to get reducer. We take the reducer script and we make, and this is our working directory, we make in our working directory various copies, sorry, various copies of reducer. Whoops based on um, 
uh, or using from the pQuery framework uh, this pQuery pre-producer script. So basically, you know, it just uh, takes this, uh, copies it into each of their own individual uh, reducer scripts. Then it uh, extracts. So you have the error log and the core dump. It uh, has each of those has their own failing statements, and those statements are inserted. Uh, into, uh, let's put it over here, insert it into SQL traces um, specifically for each uh, specifically for each trial and then reducer will reducer those reducer scripts each with their own uh, individual SQL um, file you get the ID each of those with their own specific SQL file will start reducing those SQL files uh, with the information from the error log and the core dump included and so we will end up with very nice and clean uh, SQL test cases so if all of that looked a little bit complex let's go and have a look what the script has done and then it will make a little bit more sense hopefully so you can read all of the information there um, we don't have to go through that now okay so we can still see our uh, trial directories there, um, but now we also see the reduced scripts. And again, you can just continue running this. Um, it will automatically pick up the ones that it's already done. See, it will just skip to the next trial. Um, uh, and the ones that it hasn't done yet, uh, it will process. As you can see here, uh, it's added uh, one particular crash here on, on this particular file. So here you can see the reducer scripts ending up and uh, you could simply go ahead and delete those and rerun uh, pQuery prep run and it will nicely uh, recreate them. Okay, so let's have a look at these uh, scripts. So um, let's have a look at uh, inside a script and see uh, what has happened. Okay, so... Um, in this case, uh, it's just going to use uh, TMPFS for reduction. And, and remember, this is reducer. This is uh, what's going to reduce our uh, original test cases to shorter versions. This directory is not uh, uh, important because it's only when this option is set to one uh, to tray that this will be of interest. Uh, we're going to look at uh, reducer in much more depth later on because it's quite uh, uh, involved tool uh, as to what it can do. Very simple to use for a uh, starter, but uh, very complex uh, if you want to go into uh, more detailed uh, reduction of test cases. Okay, so uh, scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down, there is a machine config configurable variable section here, uh, and uh, you can see here this little delimiter. Uh, this is what other scripts use uh, to automatically insert settings, and so that's what has happened here. And you can see that it's set to mode 3, and if we scroll up, mode 3 means uh, look for some sort of text string in the MySQL D error log. And remember that we have that text string from the error log. Um, so that's exactly the one we want to scan for to ensure that when we start reducer, it's going to reproduce the same crash. So the text is to scan for. Please leave the three spaces at the front there. It's it's used uh, in a particular fashion, um, and then the base directory. So it's automatically extracted all that to the input file and and see there's the reference right. There's a trial number and there's our SQL file, the sequential SQL file generated by pQuery, um, originally based on a random fashion of reading from that SQL file, but then written sequentially as it went along and at some point it crashed. Um, and then uh, the extra settings. So here uh, my save is merged, uh, my extra and my save from the original script is merged into one big my extra. So it's just something to be aware of. Uh, it says, okay, modify this reducer to run pQuery because you can also run this directly against uh, MySQL client, for example which in some cases might be interesting, and uh, point it to some uh, pQuery location. So all of this is automatically inserted by that pQuery prep reducer script, and each of those has their own reducer script. So very handily, one could now just go reducer uh, 5, and uh, there we go. It would simply start reducing for trial number 5, the SQL file, and you can see it here, the, the SQL file generated by pQuery, 
uh, into a smaller test case. I will have a look a lot more into reducer later on. Um, very often this is enough and you will end up with a six or seven uh, line test case. In some cases it will uh, need a little bit of uh, hand holding uh, as to how you reduce. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you more about that uh, when we get to the reducer episodes because there's three different episodes on uh, reducer alone. Okay, so uh, just coming back here to the overview. Uh, of course, a number of these are going to be known issues, and um, a number of these are going to be known issues, and a number of these are going to be duplicate issues. So something that became quite clear quite quickly, I suppose, is that we needed to have uh, some sort of filtering and some sort of reporting um, as to what was going on with uh, these particular uh, trials. Uh, out of interest, uh, and I've just grabbed one randomly, believe me or not, um, uh, how could I not, because <laughs> it's a random run, um, this uh, particular reducer uh, has uh, run 10 threads to see if all 10 threads reproduce the issue. Uh, all 10 threads have reproduced the issue, so the issue is not sporadic, and um, you can see how it's starting to uh, reduce uh, the SQL file by eliminating chunks, and depending on whether it's successful or not, the chunk size will increase or decrease, um, and a random, uh, uh, it will take random blocks, but a non-random a reduction or increase of the chunk size is programmed into reducer and so within let's see we started at 1120 we're now two or three minutes later uh, two minutes later and we've gone from uh, an original input file of 20 29,000 lines we are now at uh, 14,000 lines already uh, reducer is very very fast uh, especially when it starts up it will start uh, with very big chunks you can see here it tried to drop 23,000 lines at once, then 18,000 didn't work, didn't work, uh, then 14,000 that did work, uh, and and so on. So, yeah, it goes uh, it goes very very quick. Okay, so we're down to 10,000 lines. I'm going to stop this, uh, but basically you can see. Uh, okay, so it's saving the last known good MySQL D error log output issue. <laughs> In other words, the bug that we're looking for, which is uh, uh, this one here. Um, into this particular uh, SQL underscore out. So you will notice that it's the original input file, uh, trial 5, the pQuery output uh, the thread file, underscore out. So in other words, it's, uh, it's put a secondary file there with a reduced, uh, amount of, uh, reduced amount of lines. So I'm just going to cancel out of this. And when you control C again, it captures that action and it gives you a full uh, summary. And we could uh, we could have a very quick look at. Uh, um, it's also created all these nice scripts, which make it easy to uh, start the server, run the test case, and these are much more comprehensive than that start script that I was showing you before. These these do nearly everything, right? They are an almost 100%, or they are 100% match of our. Um, system, uh, MySQL D start options and everything included. We, well, I'm sure that in the reducer episode we'll, we'll see uh, more of that, but just as a quick example, so you can see everything is nicely being started and you can run the same test case, etc. Um, and so let's have a, um, let's have a um, quick look at uh, Okay, so you can see it saves. By the way, it saves one backup copy from the previous uh, simplification, just in case that the last one doesn't work, which shouldn't really happen. But you know, you know, there's a previous uh, successful reduced file there as well. So original line uh, on originally 29,000 lines reduced to about 11,000, and the previous one 14,000. So this is the one that you would post your bug report when it's fully done. And usually you can get to as low as uh, five lines or thereabouts. With some issues, it will be more. It will be. Um, it, it might be like 70 or 70 or so lines, uh, probably not more than that. Um, but that happens only very occasionally, uh, maybe one in every 30 or so. Okay. So 
You could go ahead and reduce all of these and have a little bit of fun and end up a test case and start logging bug reports. But uh, probably some developer would slightly start getting upset with you um, because you might be logging duplicate bug reports. So how do we prevent that? This is where the secondary utilities come in. There is a pQuery um, sorry, pQuery clean known script which will uh, look at that uh, txt file which has all the bug strings in it and we'll look at the reducer scripts. The reducer scripts have to be there so you have to run pQuery prep red uh, pQuery prepare reducer script first. Once those are there you can run the script and it will filter all the issues. I will not run that at the moment because I want to first show you something else. Remember that most of those bugs are already known and we've already locked them. I want to show you um, pQuery results. Okay, so this is a very nice utility. Uh, it's created as a bit of cooperation between myself and Ramesh, um, and it's it's uh, I think it's great. Uh, basically, it grabs all these reducers, shows you all the particular bugs it found, and so you know how long have we been running? About a uh, just under an hour, and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, individual issues um, and you can see okay this is this issue has been seen so many times in these particular reducers right so now we're a whole lot further we can see our bugs we can see which particular uh, uh, reducers reproduces them and this is great like let's say that this is a new bug it clearly isn't and this is one that uh, we should eliminate as soon as possible um, when this particular bug uh, happened, it happened for, or it happened in these particular trials, and so let's say that this is a new bug, we could uh, start reducer 103, whoops, and it would reduce um, the SQL input, f uh, the SQL output file uh, from 103 into a small test case. Let's say that that fails, um, for instance it doesn't reproduce. Then we could try 105 or 106 or maybe 37 or something like that, which is a different run, different SQL file, like if we would uh, look at... Uh, so what is 103? So we got this one and we have... Um, 88 for example, which is another one uh, of the same one. You can see very different uh, SQL input file and sequentially they will look very very different um, because of course they have been completely randomly executed by um, um, 88 pQuery thread and we'll just do the first bit and you can see straight away there's a lot of differences right this is uh, 10 lines 10 lines are different straight from the outset um, uh, of course I can't conclude that from using head but you get what I mean they're very different files okay so great that we can see all these issues but still we need to filter right because if if um, you know if we're going to spend time reducing a test case for this particular bug it's a bug that we've already seen so what do we do we run uh, and now we can use this utility clean um, oops pquery clean oh there we go we should have been a little bit more consistent but using dashes or underscores. <laughs> okay, so when you run this, and again, notice that all of these scripts are executed, and that's something that I might have forgotten to mention in this episode. I did mention it in a previous one. It has to be all executed from uh, within this directory, and if you put, uh, and now you can see why I said this earlier, if you put Procona QA in your home directory, then it's very easy to always reference this, uh, just using tilde, Procona QA, and then the script you want to use. Um, so pQuery results, pQuery prep reducer, uh, pQuery clean known, they're all referenced in the same way. It all works uh, quite well if you, if you set it up this way. Okay, so it's gone through and it's just deleted all these files and the reason why it's done that is because it's found these particular strings in the known issue list and it's deleted them so I assume that there is no issues left because we've been uh, quite diligent and uh, thank you to my colleague Ramesh who's been um, <laughs> 
he described to me the other day that uh, when he comes into work he always checks if there is a new trial uh, that failed, if there is a new bug, and if there is then he logs it, and I've indeed been seeing the commit messages uh, here and there, a bug at the time uh, has made our list fairly complete uh, as far as Percona server is concerned. So um, if I now run uh, BigQuery results, Okay, great. Uh, something is wrong. Actually, in this case, something is right. Uh, there's no reducer scripts found in directory, and when we check, uh, of course, it's all clean. So what are these directories? Well, they're directories that have been produced. Uh, you can see they're all higher numbers that have been produced since we last ran pQuery prep reducer, right? So there's no reducer scripts for it yet, so nothing uh, for those new trials was uh, done yet. So we could go ahead and uh, simply run the script again and uh, it's going to do the same once more. It's going to start analyzing each of these trials and uh, prepare reducer scripts for each of those. So let's assume that you're testing some new branch uh, or something like that and you should really have a think about SQL interleaving. We'll talk about that more in episode 13 but it's a very powerful way to test new features. Um, just as a sneak preview, um, you can run um, quite diligent uh, feature testing by taking the SQL relevant to that particular feature, uh, slightly randomizing it, and then SQL interleaving it, so in other words, interleaving it within the main SQL file that we use, uh, of course, sufficiently so that it's hit uh, enough times, and then uh, do a standard pQuery run, and if you've been uh, quite diligent in clearing out your other bugs, then you're going to see all the feature bugs that are there in that feature straight from the outset. So, very powerful. Of course, you can do the same if you're trying to test a new storage engine or anything like that. You're, you're going to be in control of your QA environment instead of um, uh, testing uh, feature by feature uh, and then at the last moment doing some integration testing which uh, might uh, be one way of looking at things but the problem is that integration testing is done at the end of it there might be only a few weeks allotted for it the release has to go out of the door marketing uh, is going to be unhappy if the release is delayed uh, etc so you know, obviously when all of these features come together, you know, the fireworks really might start happening and so there's a better way of going about things where from the outset you're going to know if feature is quality in combination with all of the other things that are there already and that's uh, that's basically what SQL interleaving is about. But I'll, I'll show you that a bit more in, in episode number 13. Okay, so uh, again we've run pre pre producer, created a bunch of reducer scripts, um, we can have a um, look at what sort of bugs it's found this time. Uh, so there's a few different ones there. There's a protocol and statement one that I was mentioning earlier. Um, and we can simply go ahead and clean those known issues. Let's see if we found anything new. No, we didn't find anything new. So. If you were to run this on uh, upstream, uh, for instance, one of the new 5.7 releases, you would uh, you would most definitely see uh, some new issues. If you were to run it on MariaDB, you would see hundreds of issues because we haven't uh, tested that particular uh, branch. If you run this on WebScale MySQL, the same deal. Um, so get in control of your QA environment and have a play with all these tools. Um, it will really give you some power and some overview as to what's happening with your uh, particular release of MySQL. Okay, so let's summarize. So this far we've um, had a quick recap and a QA run setup. We uh, slightly walked through that again. I'm quite happy that we spent some time on that because it uh, will give you a better understanding about uh, how it works. Then we looked into pQuery per producer which creates the um, reducer script. We looked into pQuery clean known, um, but before we did that we looked into results which uh, gave us the results here and then we cleaned uh, up, we filtered all the known issues. And as a little bonus I'd like to show you pQuery reach. So um, 
all of this has been very nice so far, right? It's 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 high end. We have um, we have uh, BigQuery run. It comes up with all these uh, different issues, and then uh, we say, okay, if you know some of these issues, we'll scrape them out, and then. Um, uh, report on the issues that uh, that are new and then we can go and uh, reduce uh, these into smaller test cases and finally we can go and uh, lock some nice bug reports and the developers will be happy. So all of this is uh, nice and handy but um, at some point uh, even this became a little bit tiresome believe it or not uh, we've been going on this for many months now and so how about if you could automate all this? <laughs> um, the the ultimate dream of any QA is I'll start up my script and it will automatically log bug reports for me. And we got quite close to that. Um, so there's pQuery Reach. And what does pQuery Reach do? Well, uh, actually it does, uh, it does all of this. It uh, basically uh, does all of this in, a, in an automated fashion for you, bug by bug. Uh, so what do I mean with uh, bug by bug? Let's have a look. Okay, so first of all, notice that over time we have a number of SQL files and we've got some extra SQL files that I've been uh, playing around with here. Uh, but of course we have our main uh, SQL files. But still, you end up with a few interesting SQL test uh, cases, uh, not test cases, sorry, uh, SQL uh, files uh, for for using with BigQuery. And you can see those uh, from within the uh, BigQuery subdirectory. So running with uh, each of those individually, again, would complicate even further that process which I was trying to show you before. So at some point BigQuery Reach was born um, and uh, even that didn't go far enough. Uh, we made, uh, or uh, I programmed at some point BigQuery Reach++. Plus plus. Um, so BigQuery Reach++ plus plus is a wrapper around BigQuery Reach and BigQuery Reach is a very automated high-end utility which wraps around BigQuery Run, does a lot of stuff um, uh, completely automatic pretty much everything we've seen so far so here you pointed to a base directory you pointed to a working directory and you specify the number of threads and that's all uh, you simply let it run and it will find new bugs for you uh, it will do cleanups it will do uh, reduction automatically it will do everything um, so you start be creator reach Okay, so what it's done here, it started uh, 10 different uh, screen sessions, uh, each with uh, five client threads uh, below it, and uh, each of those um, is running uh, BigQuery Rudge and therefore BigQuery Run in the background. So let's have a look at one of them so we can get an idea as to uh, what is happening. The first one. Okay, so pQuery reach is being started. Uh, so it's randomly selected a pQuery binary. Remember how I said in the beginning using different uh, pQuery binaries might produce different crashes. Uh, it's randomly selected a SQL input file and it's randomly selected trial duration. In this case 138 seconds. So <laughs> random is not random but in this case you cannot be <laughs> more random <laughs> than, than this. Um, it runs. Uh, it uh, runs into. Uh, it runs a particular trial, and um, these trials are very similar. So again, this is just BigQuery Run starting uh, in the background here. You can see it's a customized BigQuery Run, and uh, when it will run into an issue, it will uh, pick up on that and automatically start reducing it, filtering the known issues, etc., etc., etc. So very powerful for. Um, finding uh, more bugs. Uh, stopping this uh, quote-unquote monster is uh, slightly hard to <laughs> to do because you've got all these screen sessions in MySQL D um, to give you an idea, you know, got all these MySQL Ds running. Um, still, you know, it's it's uh, it's possible using one of the kill uh, commands or one of the skill scripts uh, um, uh, that uh, 
uh, that you might have developed. Um, you could uh, get an ID if you like. There's a little uh, kill script here, um, fairly straightforward, just uh, grabbing uh, uh, Mongo, uh, so you can change that to MySQL D, uh, print a process ID, and then uh, XARC set into kill, uh, which kills off uh, all of those processes. You can do the same with screen, uh, and then use uh, screen minus wipe uh, to delete any uh, leftover screen sessions that are uh, hanging. Okay, so in any case, I wanted to show you pQuery reach. Uh, once you've gotten hold of pQuery run, uh, and once uh, you've filtered nearly every bug out there, of course, if you have to start from scratch, like let's say you want to test WebScale SQL or uh, MariaDB or something like that, then you want to start with pQuery run simply because of its uh, handy overview features, uh, and you can get a good idea. But once you've filtered nearly every bug, you want to come back to um, pQuery reach and uh, you can go slightly further and squeeze every uh, non-living bug <laughs> out of MySQL D. So that was pQuery reach. Uh, that was all for uh, MySQL episode number six. Uh, my name is Rul van der Par. I work for Pecona. I've been doing QA for four years. Um, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you. God bless.